welcome Dermot and Richard, Dr. Richard Millwood. Um, we're going to do our, uh, this week's, uh, or this month's webinar is about uh, knowledge creation. Um, so i just going to, I suppose, briefly explain. Dermot, do you want to say anything before I start talking anymore? Uh, no, no, Helen, you fire away. Yeah, good to okay. see you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So basically it's uh, looking at um, knowledge creation and I suppose in a bit of, uh, you know, applying it in the real sense, what I've done is just to be like you, Dermot, I want to, uh, I, you've been using your doodly, that's what it is, to create uh, your little videos. So I decided I'm going to learn something new and I'm using Powtoon. So uh, it's nothing like, um, I think learning when you've got a need to learn something. And I think it, it will be useful at times, uh, you know, when in, in, the in the classroom. But also what I was very conscious of was, how was I learning? And, and, you know, so I was, you know, I knew what you could do. I'd seen what you, you know, with the writing and stuff like that. Yeah. So I wanted that. And also um, I, you know, like say, I would have edited videos and stuff like that, but still you're the whole time looking at the user interface. You're saying, where's this, you know, how do I make the MP4? You know, and you keep on hitting dead ends and you have to go back and you get frustrated and you make mistakes. And I think it's, it's all those. That, so that's what was happening. So anyway, I have created this uh, like sort of two minute uh, Powtoon and it is my first attempt. But again, it's just I, I really like I kind of it's like sort of a meta learning for me of how you learn uh, like your knowledge and you're applying it based on previous experiences. So. What I've also done is done a backup because I'm just trying to run this here a few minutes ago and my I think it must be my it's my computer it's, it's a bit glitchy so we'll see how it goes okay but it's all live and this is life okay What I was trying to say this is so this and, and Dermot you're going to show yours now sort of a, a more of a deep dive but what I was trying to think of it and I was thinking with my classes today I'm teaching computer science and I was looking at my fifth year computer science students today were working in groups they were making a, a micro bit uh, fit, they were using the micro bit they were making Fitbits so they were in groups and I just like there was just a diversity diversity of ideas the group knowledge why they applied th you know their experiences to it and um, and trying to problem solve. And also what was interesting, they all had the same brief. To, they had a week to make this Fitbit. And it's incredible, the diversity of ideas and the ingenuity. And, and I, that, I, when, when I was reading that, that um, brief document about uh, knowledge building, that's what I'd never come across that term ingenuity gap. And that, that's really, I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So at, at that point, I'm going to hand over to you, Dermot. 
Brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Helen. Um, so that, that was really a uh, visual presentation. Powtoon, is that? Right, Powtoon. So there's, okay. I'm cheap, okay? So that's, that is, I didn't go for the, that, that's just the free version. So you are restricted, but it's, it's just very interesting. But it's, it's you're, you're, you've inspired me because you were using Doodly, you know? So, you know, I was just looking up stuff. So that, that's how it works, you know, that this diversity of ideas and, and sharing. 100% it does, yeah, 100%. I've, I've, uh, I've reverted back to type maybe a little bit. Uh, this week, I've, I've used um, Camtasia and PowerPoint just to uh, make a presentation. And I suppose, like Helen, a lot of this comes from the DES 2020 report on the state of digital learning in primary and post-primary schools. Um, and they were looking uh, especially at analyzing the effectiveness of the digital learning framework of achieving the goals of the um, digital strategy for schools. So that's, that's, that's really where we're, we're, we're coming from tonight. And then some, some issues were highlighted in the report and the one that we've particularly zoned in on tonight is that um, teachers are having difficulty with the concept of applying a knowledge creation approach to teaching and learning in formal education or in, in primary and post-primary schools. Um, so I suppose we thought we'd have a crack at it. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, yeah, we're not masters of it. Richard will obviously... Uh, Bring, bring us through that gap, but certainly we can show some uh, evidence ourselves um, mm -hmm. of what we, we have tried. Welcome to this short presentation on knowledge creation. What is knowledge creation? Well, there are two similar but different guidelines on knowledge creation. The first comes from the Department of Education and the second is taken from the UNESCO ICT competence framework for teachers. In a recent report from the Department of Education, 52% of post-primary and 44% of primary level lessons observed aligned with the knowledge creation approach. And teachers reported finding this aspect of digital learning particularly challenging. How to design, implement and evaluate a knowledge creation approach to digital learning. First, I'm going to take the knowledge creation approach from the UNESCO ICT competence framework for teachers. And I'm going to take a pedagogy first approach. And the pedagogy I've chosen is a socially constructivist pedagogy as there is alignment between knowledge creation and social constructivism. Next, I'm going to choose the design model and the design model I've chosen is the Bridge 21 model because that aligns with a socially constructivist and socially constructionist approach. Then I'm going to design the activity. So I have a setup stage, a warm up stage, investigate stage, a plan stage, a create stage, present stage and a reflect stage. To break it down, what do the students have to do? Students have to record their progress through each task in a design document. Students have to build a model of a house that uses forms of sustainable energy. Students have to present their learning to the class and engage in a question and answer session. What does the teacher have to do? Teacher has to evaluate the design document and ensure that each task is completed. The teacher has to collaborate with the students while they are building the model and researching forms of sustainable energy. The teacher has to assess the students' competence during their presentation. So here's some evidence of the student's design document, their brainstorm, their problem statement, what they were going to do in their research, the tasks, the roles, alignment between the tasks and roles, the schedule of the tasks and activities, and a short reflection. Here's some evidence of the model. This is the house with a solar powered light and a geothermal fan. And they have put the micro bits and the wiring in the attic of the house. Evidence of their presentation with the problem statement. And then we can review the lesson. So we can review it against the Department of Education guidelines for knowledge creation, the UNESCO guidelines for knowledge creation, and we can also align it then against the digital learning framework for primary schools, 
So here I've aligned it against pupils enjoy their learning, are motivated to learn and expect to achieve as learners. And again, I then consider whether this would align with statements of effective practice or statements of highly effective practice. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's, um, that's my two cents on knowledge creation. Um, and again, what I did was I, I followed the whole process. You know, I took the uh, UNESCO guidelines, the DES guidelines, and then as people like Richard have always been encouraging me, took a pedagogy first approach, um, utilized a design model, which is one we, we've talked about quite regularly, Helen, the Bridge 21 model, um, and then followed the plan, the implementation, and the evaluation. And I, I'd argue that is there thereabouts you know there's bits and pieces obviously the longer term you could and um, develop further for example but i'm quite happy with the the outputs of the lesson and it's interesting helen how earlier you had mentioned learning from me maybe watching the duty videos i learned the micro bits from richard and there is a nice a nice hook to bring right. richard into the conversation would you like me to um, pick up now and say something about my ideas then <laughs> yeah. um, th thanks, Dermot, and thanks for the compliments. Um, you should know that they're returned to both you and Helen because of the discussions we've had over the years in the SESI context have always led to my enlightenment. But um, uh, I, my reaction to both the report and to, and to your, both your presentations is one of the pedantic, boring old farts in academia, although that I'm not particularly there now, I'm, uh, but that's nevertheless how I feel. Um, is to ask the question, what, what do we mean by knowledge in the first place? What on earth is this knowledge that we're creating? Where is it, you know? And um, I think that the term is used rather loosely to mean information and media that children make, stuff that they create. Um, and um, I, I would like to challenge that and talk about a, a richer model. So I'm gonna share my screen now and look at this model of uh, what is it that we expect from students, yeah? Now, can you, can you see all that? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I, this is not original on my part entirely, although the, the, the graphic is, but the, the idea of head, hand and heart is, is quite old. Um, uh, but it helps me to think about what is it I'm looking for from my students. I'm looking for them to know things for sure. The knowledge is in their heads. It's not the media they make, it's in their heads. And it's some um, part of the competence they have to be able to achieve in the real world, to fulfill themselves to be happy, to be um, productive, to be um, artistic, all kinds of things. Um, so competence is, to me, the overarching uh, thing that I'm trying to achieve, and knowledge is a part of that. And, and uh, a really important part of it is what I call craft, the second um, column in my diagram, which is about the stuff that Dermot was showing us, really, that, that capacity to make the stuff that works. Um, um, and in, in, in incorporated in that is the other uh, hateful word, skills. Skills is part of craft. Skills to me is something about step-by-step -step process that you, 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 like a recipe, you know, you follow what, what the, um, uh, the thing is. But it has another important aspect, which is the evaluation, being able to say, have I made something of worth? Is it actually working or not? Those kinds of judgments that you have to make when you make something. But of course, the one that everybody misses and forgets about, uh, unless you push them hard, is the character side that we hope to develop in our children. And, and character is such an important part of that competence to achieve that um, it, it has to be given equal ranking to knowledge and craft, in my opinion. Um, and yet it often isn't. Now, I, I don't need to belabor this, do I? I, I just wanted to put knowledge in its place. Um, knowledge is in people's heads. Information and media is what they make. And so when they talk about knowledge creation, I don't think they mean what the children learn, even though they do they mean that they learn by making media and information. I think that's the knowledge they're talking about. And that would be a, a point of discussion in anything that follows from now on. Um, I, I may be wrong, of course. I think that's all I wanted to say. Right. I think it's, it's uh, Richard, just jumping in there. I love that about character and, uh, you know, that heart and caring and that like today, you know, all of my fifth years, I just saw them. They were just so like that. They, you know, they they made things work, and yeah. and they and they created it from you know it was a craft. And some of them, you know, they, there was junk art involved there as well. And some of the students, you know, they they were making you know wristbands out of you know string. You know what I mean? You know, like so that that's just brilliant. You know, it's really good to see that. Yeah. 
So you can, you can find that diagram on my blog in case we'll, we'll come to that later if necessary. Okay, so we're going to hand over now. So Dermot, you're going to ask uh, the, the, the famous eight questions, is that right? <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, that is a correct. And this, this is great for me because I suppose, Richard, in, in our early years, you uh, performed the role of my supervisor uh, for a number of years. And I suppose I never got the opportunity to ask you the questions. Ah. Um, so it might be nice to have the, the roles reversed. Anyway, just, just for the listeners here, that's not the way supervision works. Students ask all the questions. Supervisors just try and dampen them down a bit and stop them from being too excited. <laughs> okay, um, right. So yeah, and just for the listeners, again, we have eight questions, which Richard has previously um, looked at. He has one minute to answer each question, and these are questions which we ask every guest who we have on the show. And obviously, at some stage, we're looking to um, put them together and maybe, you know, investigate them or examine them for, with a more critical eye. So, Richard, if you're ready, I will start with question one. So, the, the, my first connection with educational technology was when in 1978, nine, around that time, um, the school I was teaching maths and computer studies in received a new Research Machines 380Z computer. Uh, it's fantastic. You know, and better still, it was put in my care. Yeah? So I took this home every weekend and played with it. And I upskilled myself. I, I increased my craft in computing and programming in particular through working in BASIC and that. And I, I was desperate to make a program that would make a ball bounce around the screen. This is for my satisfaction, my fulfillment, nothing to do with kids or teaching, just I wanted to know better what was going on here. And um, I made that program and then so proud of it I was, I took it in and showed the children in my maths class. And they um, took to it like ducks to the water, they, they got on with playing with it, and some of them went running to the cupboard to get protractors out to hold them against the screen to work out the angle they should put into the computer to make the ball go in the pocket. Now, wow. I, 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 I realized how inadequate I was at that point in terms of motivating children to use protractors. Um, and I realized that the technology and the gaming and the fulfillment of free choice and effective action on their part was going to take them somewhere. And that led to me leaving teaching only a year or two later and starting to write simulations for the next 10 years. So you can see that's, that was my first engagement, the belief that children put in, uh, in control of a computer could benefit from the excitement of it, it producing results for their actions, okay? This one seems a bit facile, I have to say. Uh, I, I, I've written um, to make the abstract concrete, um, meaning that, that lots of mathematics um, in particular, but also science uh, and even social sciences can be uh, worryingly abstract. But what we can do with simulations on the computer is make them become concrete because, again, they make decisions, responses are made by the computer. Now, this isn't the whole of education, but it is a particular uh, motivation for me for using educational technology. Yeah, the, tr the trouble with question three is it's, it's the same as question seven and eight. And um, I, I quite like them to be in a different order, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I just have to avoid answering it the way I'm going to answer later. But my, my simple answer is to enhance the student's expressive power. And that means the knowledge creation in the sense that the DES are talking about, the making of information and media. And at the same time, this is, this is really important, at the same time, increasing their evaluative um, capability. In other words, they, they, they make a, a new piece of information, they make a new uh, thing like your house, but then they need to be able to ask the question, is it working right? And they have to have the mechanisms, the criteria, the, the thinking processes that we can help them as teachers to have to evaluate that. And of course, we as teachers can do that evaluation for them at some level, but then we can help them to develop the evaluation of uh, power that craft demands um, in, in, um, uh, in teaching and learning. Well, <laughs> I'm going to read what I wrote because I, I tried to anticipate this question and it's, this is a hard one. But because effective learning outcomes are, uh, are, are so many and so broad, but I, I wrote a deeper and broader insight into knowledge, and I mean knowledge as I wrote it earlier, yeah? Um, uh, coupled with useful skills in the craft area and character, 
all those three, in other words, to then persist with learning using technology as an augmentation of their learning capacity. So that means that they need to be patient, they need to be optimistic, they need to persevere, those kind of you know, heart things, if you want to call them that, um, that um, are, are so important. Um, and so learning outcomes from the educational use of technology are that they can do that because it's going to be with them the rest of their life. It's a bit like, you know, pencil and paper is going to be with you the rest of your life. If you don't know how to use a damn thing, it's never going to be useful when you're 50 or 60 or, or 90. You know? So the computer um, uh, uh, ca capacity to be able to use it, which Helen was talking about when she did her presentation uh, with Powtoon, you know, how do I get, make sense of Powtoon? That, that is a, as a learning outcome. Sounds very technology focused, but it isn't intended to be. It's meant to be learning capability focused. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the most there, general kind of learning outcome I can think of. Yeah, because it, it's, a, it's a hard question. Like it's a question that often teachers have difficulty answering. Yeah. Is what are the effective? Because people would sometimes maybe um, highlight how the kids have learned to use the technology, but that's, that's not, again, what we're talking about, although that is part of the process. And it's very troubling because um, uh, we're, we're often exhorted not to focus on the technology. Mm. but to focus on the pedagogy but to mm. me the pedagogy is intimately bound up with the expressive power of the technology and that's where this knowledge creation thing is is coming in so why should teachers be good at that unless they have the time like helen was saying to learn powtoon and to and to make sense of it mm. or you camtasia and, and powerpoint um it's the same with the children they need to learn how to use those tools to be able to be in that learning loop that i'll describe more in a minute if i get the chance Yeah, so I, I, I mean, you, 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 t you nailed this earlier when you described me as learner-centred, and I am. I'm, I'm thoroughly learner-centred, which is not to say that I don't care about teachers and teachers' role and the systems that must be in place to help the learner be learner-centred, for Christ's sake. Um, but, um, yeah, my philosophy is that we should recognise um, the engine of learning that children have in their, in, in, their, in their whole psyche, you know, that they are um, inveterate learners. They want to learn, in fact, all the time. And that, that, that we defeat that sometimes, um, not deliberately, not because we're bastards, um, we're not grad grinds, but we defeat it simply because um, we don't give enough opportunity to free choice and effective action. And these are drivers of delight in learning for me. And um, so the challenge to teachers is how to, uh, on the one hand, do what the political masters and the parents and the industry want of us to deliver certain outcomes of uh, children's um, profile to be future employees or citizens or whatever, um, to try and get over that and at the same and, and, and take confidence that children will learn if we only give them the space and, and the choices and the guidance on how to evaluate their learning. It's not like we're leaving them to uh, discovery learning in a kind of hippie style 60s thinking, uh, which I think is much maligned by the way and, and incorrectly, but that's nevertheless the, the myth we have. Learner centeredness isn't about that. Learner centered is about how to support, how to guide, how to put frameworks in place so that children can build the capacity to be learner centered in, in their own right. Yeah, so you'd, you'd expect me to um, have a good answer to this, uh, Dermot, because this was my PhD. Yeah. And <laughs> so you have to start with the question, you know, knowledge transferred. What do we mean by that? Do we mean knowledge like I described it, or do we mean knowledge? as in media and information that children make or that teachers make and hope that children can make in the same way or by copycatting. No, we, what, we, what we mean by knowledge surely is something that sits in the mind of the learner and mm. uh, put, allows them to perform in the ways that I've described earlier. And um, I believe that that knowledge isn't transferred. It's not transferred. There's no little you know, pipe that goes from teacher to, to child and we pour it down that pipe. And many people have said that, but there is something to be said about um, how they acquire the knowledge that the teacher has, which isn't the same as saying transfer. And the answer is they, they acquire it through expressing their ideas in response to what they hear from teachers and what they see from the resources and the books they read and the films they watch and so on. So um, for me, um, it, they need to express what they hear. And of course, when they hear things, they are expressing already. This is much misunderstood. When you go to a lecture, even the people that are listening to what I'm saying, um, they are being expressive because they're thinking thoughts. Their thoughts are their thoughts. They're not my thoughts. 
um, I, I, you can hear my voice, you can hear my words, but then you reconstruct that in your mind in the way that you hear it. And depending on your um, a, a acquaintance with my particular words and your own ideas, you'll construct it differently. So Helen and Dermot and, and Hassan and anybody else who's listening are almost certainly making their own minor difference and take on what I'm saying, depending on their experience and their own uh, inquiry into the philosophy of education. So expression is the key active thing that students do, followed by um, evaluation of their expression. They ask the question when they're thinking, does this make sense to me? They ask the question when they say something out loud, like I am doing, is Dermot nodding? Is Helen nodding? Are they showing me that they've understood that, what I'm saying? Or are they just being polite? Yeah? And, 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 and determining that, of course, is quite a difficult thing to do. But mostly when it comes to the verbal feedback that people give you, um, or, or even the written feedback from marking from a teacher, that can be really valuable in reconceptualizing your ideas, as long as you take it seriously and you're in the habit of taking it seriously. Yeah? So it's important that we understand the importance of marking and, and, and basic teacherly kind of activities like that. But of course, the, 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 the crucial part is this is a dynamic, not simply uh, an expression and an evaluation. It's a cycle. Having evaluated your expression, the key act in learning is you go back and re-express the same idea again, um, perhaps enhanced and deepened and, and perfected by the evaluation you've just done. And you go in that loop throughout your life. You never stop doing that. Um, I'm still, in every time I explain this to people, what I've just been saying, perfect my own uh, understanding of what I'm saying. I wake up in the night, you'll, you'll think I'm boring, but I wake up in the night thinking about it and thinking, I didn't get that right, did I? I need to say this a little bit more emphatically, or I need to add that nuance into the discussion to get clearer about what I'm talking about and to understand better what I think is going on in the world. In other words, to improve my knowledge, yeah, which is learning. I, th I, I, I think I've, I've almost said enough about that already. Yeah? What I mean by that is I've said what my pedagogy is, but I haven't really linked it to the specific character of technology and, and how it can support that pedagogy. So I have a poster which I, I, I can link. Um, you, you know, I have written a blog about this for tonight so people can follow this up afterwards. And in it, I talk about what I call expressive creativity on the part of the learner and evaluative power on the part of the learner these two parts of what I was talking about earlier. And how does, it, how does technology enhance expressive creativity? Well, I, I argue that through delight, through automation, through multimodality, through provisionality, through constraint, through neutrality, and through quality. Now, I can't explain all of those, so, so I'll pick one, which is provisionality, okay? Um, when a child goes to write something down, express their ideas in writing, um, they are rather, uh, troubled, especially if they use a pen, by the fact that as they write, they're making a permanent mark. That yeah. means that to correct it, they have to get the tip X out or start a new piece of paper, just tear it up and throw it away and start again um, in order to correct it. And that, I think, is daunting. But when we use a word processor, and once we know how word processors work, we know we can start writing and we know we're going to be able to correct it and leave a perfect copy. Um, and something that looks nice and is, is, uh, is, is more accurate, if you like, because we've had a chance to review it before submitting it to anybody else in a much cheaper way, in a much more effective way than pen and paper or any other uh, uh, way of expressing ideas. That's what digital technology has brought, this kind of fluidity of expression, this capacity. And if you know that in advance of expressing ideas, um, that you're going to be provisional about them, and you can start sketching things and then fix them up as you go along and check the spelling later. That, that can uh, hearten uh, the kind of child who is obsessed with getting their spelling right and hates the fact that they can't. Or they like to get the typography looking good so it's clear and readable, but they hate the fact that their handwriting is so poor that they cannot um, construct the right letters the way they want them to be. But with a computer, by God, they've got fonts to call on, they can change the size, they can make it as clear as they like, and they can do that after they've started writing. So they don't have to stop on the, on the basis that, um, oh God, it's gonna look awful. Now I'm, I'm, I'm a personal um, fan of this idea of provisionality because when I was at school, my handwriting was abysmal. And I, I, I found myself in second level uh, learning as a student writing in, in uppercase letters only. 
because I just could not form the kind of handwriting that I believed was nice. And I hated it and I didn't write much. And I ended up being a mathematician for that reason because you don't have to write much in maths, not like you have to in English or in history or geography. And I was never in the social sciences as a school child for that reason, I believe. I'm much more interested in those things now. So, so I picked on the particular feature of technology that supports my pedagogical model uh, uh, in this case to answer your question. I hope that was helpful. Of course, if you go to my PhD, you can read all the other ones um, and that, that, that will be homework for everybody. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> this is such a, a, a challenging thing. Um, I think I, I think I, I kind of I, I can't I can't easily answer this question, but I can say what the criteria are. That, yeah, and the criteria are that we um, when we design that future learning for children, we put them at the centre of that educational design. And I have a poster for that, which again is linked by that link we, we talked about. That poster tries to list um, the eight, as I conceive it, questions that a learner needs to be able to answer. And typically what happens in education at the moment is that we answer them for them. We don't give them the chance to begin to engage with those questions um, very much. We take it as our responsibility as teachers to do it. But my belief is that 21st century learning, they will answer those questions. And just so you get an idea of what they are, the eight keywords are motivation, importance, meaning the importance of what they're learning. Why is it important? Process, uh, how am I doing this? Community, how is everybody else going to help me? Environment, um, where and when am I going to be doing this? Um, source, where does it come from and how do I know it's good? Uh, assessment, meaning the, the, the formative assessment, how do I know that I've achieved anything and what am I going to do next? And then finally, number eight is recognition, the idea that I get some kind of reward, uh, authority, authoritative accreditation, a, a qualification from this. What's that going to be? How does that work? Now, we need to help children to answer those questions for themselves, not just because that's 21st century learning for me, but because it means that they're able to learn in the 22nd century as well. The whole of their life, they're going to be able to learn because they are aware of the educational process that surrounds them. I don't think it's as complicated as I make it or as hard for them to do this. It's a matter of engaging them in that process and having them take part in the organization of learning, not just be subject to the organization of learning. And that's not in any way to diminish our skill and our expertise as teachers to do that organization well. It's simply to say we must hand the responsibility over through the life of a child in progressive ways through from primary to secondary and beyond. That's, that's fascinating, Richard. Obviously, there's so many follow-up questions there um, that we could have. Um, but I guess it's back to you. Helen, thank you so much for answering those, Richard. Obviously, thank you. Pleasure. Um, yeah, I yeah. guess it's back to Helen. And Helen, yeah. Fa fa yes, and absolutely fascinating. You know, the, the, I think I'm going to have to re-watch this again, you know, because there's just so much that you've said there, Richard, and uh, so much to go from there. So I'm just conscious of time, um, and like it's late on a, a Wednesday evening. I don't have anything other than maybe just to wrap up here and uh, thank you very much, Richard, for the time uh, for spending with us this evening. Um, it's really, you know, a lot to, to think about and uh, you too, Dermot, like, you know, the, the just these webinars, you know, I come away and learn so much from these, you know, as well. So that, uh, and, you know, empowers us for the next time. And Helen, you, you know where I live. I mean, in other words, you know my email and my Twitter details and so on. Um, if, and, and that goes for you too as well. Um, people can always come back with questions later when they realise the enormity of what they, they missed. <laughs> <laughs> Look, what I mean is we, we pushed a lot out, you know, a, a lot of complex stuff out. And, and I, I know I'm guilty of that. Um, so if there's a clarification that, that comes later, um, I'm, I'm ready for it and I'm willing to respond. Okay, great. So I think we'll, we'll, I think there's no questions. So we'll wrap up. Um, I know that uh, we have what's lined up in a month's time. Oh, Dermot has something to say. Okay, I'll pass I do, it back. I do have, we need to plug the upcoming SESI conference. Yes. yes. And at the moment, there is the call for presentations. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if there's anybody in primary, post-primary, third level, um, even further education, further educate, even preschool, I think, um, at this stage, that if they are interested in submitting a proposal 
to present at the SESI conference, which will take place online. They can find out more details about this on SESI.ie, so the mm -hmm. website and call for presentations up there. And the conference date, Helen, is? 27th, 27th of February, Saturday, 27th of February, and it is online, yeah. And are we allowed to announce the keynote speaker? I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, just, it, um, uh, it just went out on Twitter. Adapting digitally to a changing reality. That's yes, it. Saturday, 27th of yeah. February. And so yeah. who's our next guest, Helen? Who, who, who's next in the, if we can, if we can get anybody to match the, uh, <laughs> the eloquence. I can, tell the you, eloquence. I can tell you personally that it's Tony Riley and he's considerably better than I am. No, 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 no. We have not a change. Quite. Yes, we have a change. Oh, it's not. It it's is. not Tony. I'm sorry. Yeah. Tony, Tony will be. Tony's is lined up. <laughs> it's it's Mr. Hassan Daba. <laughs> oh, even better then. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about. Uh, so at this time of the year, you know, if you're an IT coordinator or if you're in a school, you know, you're going to start thinking about you know uh, hardware and software requirements, and so just getting your head around that. And it's like all part of that digital learning framework that you have to think in. So the implementation. Is there anything else you want to add, Hassan or Dermot, to that? Um, do you know what? I think, uh, for, first of all, Richard, thank you very much. Um, mm. I think it's very mean that you put me on as right after Richard. Like, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, could you not have put me after somebody else? Uh, but no, 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 uh, that's in a nutshell, that's what I'll cover. Uh, it's that time of year, you're halfway through, computers have broken, the ones that are broken are now fixed. How can, how can we get them back up and running for the year ahead? Some simple solutions and some simple hacks as well that'll, um, that'll help you out. And can I, just before we go, Hassan, this is something that jumped in, and Richard, you might jump in on this quickly. Um, Hassan, if you don't mind me saying, you perhaps felt a bit of trepidation about putting your name forward to, uh, to present as you are an outsider to the teaching profession in the sense that you're not a practicing but qualified teacher. However, there would be a unique insight that would come from your perspective on digital learning. Um, yes, um, I think I prefer it when you put Helen on the spot, uh, Dermot, frankly. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't, it's, I felt, it's not the outsider, the, outs the outsider is fine because I, I get to see things in a school that maybe not everybody gets, gets to see. But I feel that teachers learn, the peer-to-peer -peer thing is teachers learning from teachers. They don't, do they really need to know how the computer works or how to make it work better? Should it not just work? That's, that's, that's my fear. Should the teacher not go in and like a light switch, it should yeah, just yeah, work. You, you, that's, Hassan, you're spot on. It's such an interesting question. And um, can I just say that, um, Unlike, um, say, the bridge that you know you cross the river with, or the car that you start in the morning, which mostly starts. Um, uh, you're right. Um, computer technology has been uh, plagued over the years with being uh, unreliable, poorly designed, difficult to get going, hard to learn when when new software, um, and teachers are assailed by those challenges. So you need to pay attention to it, but not necessarily um, to reassure them that everything's going to be fine, but to give them strength and resilience, patience, optimism, and perseverance in the face of such a, a messy um, implementation. And the reason for it is because the technology has in no way settled down yet. You know, cars are, I mean, I know cars are still developing, but then, you know, the rate of change for, for computers is, you know, new models are every, every year, um, new features, speed doubling every, um, every few years, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and suddenly, you know, um, speech to text, um, optical character recognition, funny things happening that you know, we didn't know we could do even. Um, I think this is a, a persistent and painful challenge for teachers that's been going on all the life I've had in technology. And it's your insight and your thinking about that, um, your abilities and, and your competence and your character, can I say, about how to deal with it, that they need uh, the sucker of uh, having a conversation with you about. So, so go for it and, and be brave and 
and, and don't doubt that teachers are struggling with it and that you can help them. I, 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 thank you very much, Richard. I, I do have no doubt that teachers are struggling with it and there are, there are solutions available, yeah. but just not being implemented at the moment. Yeah, but don't be it's an just, apologist for the technology. <laughs> don't be a what? An apologist for the technology. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm an educational you technologist. Critic, yeah. you can no. Give them the, the power of your critique of it, you know. <laughs> I, I pride myself on being an educational technologist, and I didn't know what that was four years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it's just back to when to present here in this forum. Yeah. I felt the peer-to-peer -peer teachers learn from teacher. It should be about the pedagogy. Am I saying this right? Rather than the mechanics of it. The and mechanics I reject, of the technology. I, re I reject that analysis. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I accept your rejection. Not, not because you're wrong, <laughs> but because it's not subtle enough. You know, it's not an either or. It's not a this or that. Um, the fact is that the technology and its expressive power is deeply bound up in learning and pedagogy. And that's what I've been trying to say tonight. So as a result of that, you need to be able to face the misery of dealing with the damn technology and its failings. But I don't think, te okay, so we're going down a rabbit hole now and at 48 <laughs> minutes, yeah. But That's I the just trailer. That's the trailer for the next for next month. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> we've that 48 be minutes. That would be important. Thank you, every, each and every one of you. And uh, stay safe. And we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks' time again. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Bye. Thank you, Hassan. Thank, Thank you, you Richard. Thank you so much.